episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. So uh, welcome, everybody, again to another episode of our show. I have another really fascinating guest for you today, uh, helping to, uh, to make a better tomorrow for all of us. Uh, again, we're going to be moving into the uh, aging and healthy longevity front. Uh, and today we have the the honor of being joined by Dr. Daniel Ives, who is uh, both founder and chief executive officer of a company called Shift Biosciences, a uh, biotech company uh, that is endeavoring to make drugs for cellular rejuvenation in humans uh, through the applications of machine learning, uh, focusing on so-called driver clocks for cellular reprogramming, and we'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, and he's the scientific founder who first discovered uh, gene shifting targets uh, upon which the Shift the Drug Discovery Platform is currently based. Uh, Dr. Ives graduated uh, from Imperial College, uh, originally with a degree in biochemistry, got his PhD in 2013, uh, working at MRC Mitochondrial Biology Unit in Cambridge, uh, and carried out his postdoc work uh, under Dr. Ian Holt at the National Institute of Medical Research in Mill Hill, now part of the Crick Institute, uh, pursuing uh, various damage removal strategies for mitochondrial DNA mutations. Uh, in 2016, Dr. Ives left Crick and founded Shift Biosciences uh, with this goal to commercialize at uh, time mitochondrial targeted drugs for age linked diseases, incorporating uh, a wide range of tools, including novel aging biomarkers, CRISPR screens, and other tools, uh, really looking to dissect true functional drivers uh, of various aging phenotypes. So, uh, with that introduction, Dr. Daniel Ives, thanks so much for taking the time to come on the show. Thanks for inviting me on. Uh, I'm a big fan. I, I, I'm a big fan of your work as well, and I'm really glad you're here today, Daniel. Um, love to start off like we typically do, really just by handing you the floor for a little bit to talk about you. Uh, if you can just take us back a little bit, uh, uh, sort of everything from where you grew up, how you got interested in, in biochemistry, uh, sort of the biology of aging, and, and why aging became really a, a passion of yours. Yeah, so I guess I'm going to be going earlier than I have before, so uh, I think... To begin with, it's probably yeah, it's, you know, around age 15 or 16. Um, you just tend to be better at some subjects than others. And I happen to be good at biology and chemistry. And then I, <laughs> I put those two together, which made biochemistry. And that was my university degree. Um, and I, you know, I spent a lot of time, uh, you know, sort of looking at all of the various layers, right, of biology. It's such a, it's such a fantastic story, the story of biology. And there's like so many chapters, there's so many characters. It's almost impossible to keep up these days. But biochemistry for me was like, you know, that's the way to learn most of the story. Yeah? You've got to sort of go right down to the granular level. Um, and when I sort of finished uh, that biochemistry, biochemistry, <laughs> biochemistry degree uh, in 2008, basically you had the financial crisis and uh, I was sort of looking at jobs in pharma. Um, but basically all these jobs evaporated like almost overnight. And uh, the only jobs that were left were really, you know, dead end jobs you know there was no progression nothing exciting uh, but at the time Aubrey de Grey had written a book or at least I'd picked up this book it wasn't that far previous that he published it uh, called Ending Aging and you know I'd sort of learned all of this biochemistry and you know I was excited by all, all the things that were going on in the cell uh, because you know it's a scientific topic but it's a personal topic you read these things in these textbooks and they're going on inside you it's like a, it's a really fun feeling to sort of oh look at this this scene, yeah, which is like going on in billions of different cells in my my body whilst I'm reading this. Uh, so I read this book by Aubrey called Ending Aging, and for the, it was it was the first time that somebody had sort of gone out there and articulated a coherent framework for what aging is and how to tackle it. How to tackle it's a really important point. No point knowing how things are working, and you know we can't do anything about it. It's, you know it's almost a tragedy to learn more and just realise it's all futile. But Aubrey. You know, he listed uh, a, sort of a bunch of different damage types that we should target. Uh, in the same way, you know, you target damage in your car and you can keep your car running. You can do, do so to your body, which is a slightly more advanced machine, but you can, it's, the analogy does hold. And so, you know, you, you sort of uh, get rid of types of damage. And right at the top, he said, mitochondrial DNA mutations, uh, we can combat these basically by taking the tiny mitochondrial genome, which lives outside of your main genome, it's like a little satellite genome, and, and basically taking that and putting it 
into the main genome, basically finishing what evolution started. Most of the genes from the mitochondria actually migrated over to the nucleus, uh, the main genome, um, over millions of years. There's a few that are left. And so, you know, the idea was let's finish what evolution started. Um, it, 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 you know, there are actually good reasons why these proteins are separate and it's difficult to, to finish that job. Um, so I basically applied to a job, um, a PhD position at the mitochondrial biology unit where Aubrey had a joint project with Ian Holt. At least I thought, I thought he had. Um, but it turns out by the time that I showed up and applied to this project, uh, it already sort of been terminated. The, the difficulty of achieving the goals was just too high. Uh, and like the original uh, student had moved on. But you know, so in my morning period where, you know, I, I really wanted this position, like I, there was no plan B. I just found this and that's what I wanted. And, you know, it was almost all in on this. Um, when, when it turned out this thing had been discontinued, um, I, you know, I sort of looked at other approaches in the lab and inevitably, you know, there were, there were a couple of other approaches to trying to crack the same problem, which is basically overcoming these mitochondrial DNA mutations. Uh, and I basically applied to do, uh, to do exactly that, sort of apply this alternative approach. And that's where it sort of, that's where the scientific journey started. So I was really in that institute to find technologies to overcome, you know, a, a sort of a type of damage that is potentially driving aging. We didn't know to what extent at the time, but certainly there's a lot of, you know, there's been a lot of literature linking mitochondria to aging. And uh, I worked, worked in Ian's lab, uh, it was four years, my PhD. And the short story is uh, we, we managed to find small molecules that can uh, basically bring down the level of mitochondrial DNA mutations. So they don't actually target the mitochondria. They sort of, they change the weather in the cell. I don't know if this is a good analogy. They sort of change some of the stress, stress response pathways in the cell. Um, and somehow, somehow this allows the cell to recognize mitochondria with basically damaged genomes and, and basically clear them out over time. And uh, for me, it was always about aging. So I was like, oh my God, you know, like we've, we've actually, we found a technology to tackle, you know, a type of damage in aging. Uh, but, but the lab was set up to basically focus on rare mitochondrial diseases, finding things for, you know, those diseases. And that was really the trajectory. So it was inevitable there would be a sort of a fork point where I want to go one way and uh, say, you know, Ian wants to go the other way. And uh, that came, uh, you know, I think, 2016 is when uh, sort of I decided basically things were just too slow you know I was trying to get things done which were really uh, tangential yeah to the goals of the lab and they would have cost lots of money and you know be a lot of risk and academics do need to get something back you know they need publications and I was sort of going on this you know wild west journey who knows if I'd ever get any data back um, and if I sufficiently powered the animal studies and those sorts of things so it was a good chance for me to just go for it. Yeah, if I believed in it, I should go for it. And uh, I was fortunate that my my postdoc was cut short just by like a month in Ian's lab. And uh, I got a really generous redundancy payment. It was it was about ten thousand pounds or about fifteen thousand dollars. And and I it was it was great because I'd been itching to do these experiments in a different direction. Um, mm -hmm. Basically. We had some really crude molecules that were dangerous. They just they just wouldn't be therapies. Try and find out a bit more about those, apply them in an aging direction. So I got this sort of like this windfall from this redundancy payment. Um, and so I basically just used that money to co contract experiments out to local contract research organizations. So sure. in Cambridge, UK, there's quite a rich ecosystem of these basically higher, high, you know, two higher labs. So you just go, go up to one of these labs with your experiment and you just say, look, can you do this for me? And, uh, and, and there's very high quality contract research organizations. You know, they, they challenge you to put more controls in your experiments, those sorts of things. And we were able to actually generate some really useful data with very small sums of money. And I didn't know whether this was going to be a company at the time. It was just like, let's see how far we can go. Um, we talked to a lot of people. Uh, they just said too early. It's really exciting what you're doing. We did get some small donations. Um, but largely it was like, this is too early. Uh, and, and sort of um, after, a, you know, after a few no's from people, uh, we happened across uh, Jonathan Milner, who's this fantastic angel in Cambridge, UK. Uh, he's, you know, he supports a lot of very interesting projects. You know, he does mm -hmm. all sorts of things. Uh, so lo locally, he's, you know, he's sort of the, I'd say the top life science angel in Cambridge. And we just showed him what we were doing. And he was very interested, but he said, look, this is, this is very early. Um, you know, just see how far you get. 
um, and then maybe come to me, come back to me, you know, whether when this is this has moved forward a bit. And so we spent a bit more of um, our money. I think I put in, I put in a certain amount, probably twenty k in total, uh, and my dad put in twenty twenty k. Uh, then I asked my girlfriend, uh, "Can I use your life savings for the next experiment?" <laughs> And, and she said no, which was the right answer. So she said, you should really ask somebody that can afford to lose the money. And uh, we went back to Jonathan now with more results. And he was just impressed we could do anything with the sorts of money we were spending. Because drug development is incredibly expensive. You had to, to you know, even do yeah. anything. Was, uh, and uh, he, he basically, he, he, he backed us. Um, and he, he sort of came, came, sort of came into aging uh, like very enthusiastically. There's, there's, there's a lot of examples of this. I think Jonathan was the first where somebody doesn't really know this is real yeah, or you can do anything about it. And then you just provide a little bit of detail and you start just open it. It's like Narnia. You open the cupboard and they see this whole world and they're completely captured by it. It does. It spoils people. Yeah. Once they know this is a reality and you can actually do things and these things are coming, you just can't focus on anything else. I mean, maybe that's just me, but I've seen this a few times. So, you know, with Jonathan, this was a case. Um, and more recently, uh, some some really great investors that are going to come into the field. They they've come in in a big way, like you know, like you know, almost uh, you know, put us on the back foot. It's like their enthusiasm is so strong. Uh, but there's plenty of the, you know, there's plenty of individuals that still don't know. Like the, this is gonna this is gonna happen in some form within a reasonable time frame. So Jonathan came in, he backed us, you know, beyond anything we could uh, uh, sort of possibly imagine from the enthusiasm front, and. We, we, we basically set forth on our journey that we planned. So we wanted to show that these, these molecules, you know, they could work in a dish, getting rid of mutations, but they could also do things in real organisms. So there was this mouse called the mitochondrial DNA mutator mouse. Mm -hmm. uh, it's about, it is quite, it's, it's a good name and it is a really interesting mouse. So this mouse, you, you engineer, um, just genetically engineer it to damage its mitochondrial genome deliberately. So there's a proofreading domain on the polymerase that replicates the mitochondrial genome. So you basically remove that proofreading domain and you don't fix the errors. Like every time you replicate the yeah. genome, it's punctured. And this mouse, it damages its genome two and a half thousand times higher than normal, quite a mm -hmm. big factor. And it gets premature aging and it's quite a, a comprehensive um, premature aging. So that's a very provocative finding, you know, because people would link mutations to aging previously, but this sure. was... Hey, let's go into the system, turn it, turn it up to the max. Let's see, see what happens, and you get an aging phenotype. So, we um, we wanted to show that our drug that got rid of mutations could slow aging in this model, uh, first of all. Uh, but whilst we were gearing up for this study, uh, I I I, I learned about an epi, well, the epigenetic aging clock. Sure. So for those that aren't familiar, this is the first accurate aging biomarker. So it's like I can stick a clock on the outside of your body and watch you age in real time. And like, maybe you change your behavior and I can see if that slows aging, maybe you do something unhealthy and that spins aging fast. But the key point about this clock is, is that no longer, we, we, don't, we don't have to wait two or three years to see how long a mouse lives in response to a change in diet or another intervention or a drug. We can look at the clock and within a, a, a much reduced time frame, you know, sort of weeks, not years, we can learn whether we've affected aging uh, and this, is, this has been a big game changer for the field, like having a readout of aging. So what we wanted to do, and it was Jonathan, my investor, that introduced me to this clock. Uh, and it's almost embarrassing. Well, I was the scientist, yet <laughs> he was the one that found this technology, which, um, you know, in, in hindsight, this was this sort of really changed things dramatically for us. So Jonathan said, have you, have you heard about this? Uh, the moment I heard about it, it was, it was the, it's basically the best way to fail fast as a longevity company. Like this clock is a about as close to an unbiased readout of aging as you could get, and that's that's exactly what you want when you're you know you're trying to explore hypotheses. Make sure you're working on the most you know the most powerful levers to slow down aging. So uh, we we basically learned that this clock, um, it, you know, it was originally designed for humans, but the mouse clock was actually developed by a local academic called Wolf Reich at the Babram mm -hmm. Institute. But there was no such thing as a service like you couldn't get clock measurements. So we just, you know, I emailed Wolf and Wolf said, oh, it's great. Yeah, come and come and use it. But we can't help you. Like all of our PhD students are, you know, wrapped up in their own projects. So what we were able to do with the Baker Institute, which was very forward thinking of them, they said, why don't you put your own person into the lab, you know, into Wolf's lab? Mm -hmm. um, 
and you know learn how to take these measurements and just work side by side so that people can help you but then you know their time isn't too too strained so we learned how to do these uh, clock measurements and we 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 got some results from our mouse study so a uh, couple of really interesting results. The first one was this, this mouse, where we basically increased the level of mitochondrial DNA mutations two and a half thousand times to, you know, uh, above the normal level. Uh, and it gets this premature aging phenotype. It doesn't show accelerated aging according to the clock. So this, this aging biomarker okay. that re represents physiological aging, that's, that's key, physiological aging, yep. wasn't, wasn't accelerated when we increased this damage type. So you might think, oh, that's a bizarre result. You know, you've got this aging phenotype, the clock's not doing anything. But it's, it's relatively simple to explain or at least speculate that there's many different sources of aging that sure. converge, on, converge on a phenotype. So mutations of mitochondrial DNA1, mutant lamin, which is the, uh, the, the structural protein of the nuclear envelope, or one of them. Um, if you mutate that, you get an aging phenotype completely different from mutations. Uh, double strand break repair in the yep. genome creates premature aging and physiological aging is another one and they seem to converge on this phenotype so perhaps it shouldn't be so surprising that say mutations aren't directly linked to another source of aging so that was the first result so you know ideally we wanted to show that these mutations were like very very strongly linked to the clock you know that the mutations disproportionately represented physiological aging you know, because i think lamin mutant lamins didn't affect the clock you know, so yeah. that was sort of, that was, uh, you know, that, that would, that had failed. So maybe it was the mutations. It was just a matter of going through the different sources and, you know, finding the one and linking it to the clock, but the mutations weren't linked to the clock either. Um, and then the really interesting result, which was that even though our compound, which was basically designed to reduce mitochondrial DNA mutations, even though, um, you know, it didn't affect, well, yeah, even though mutations didn't affect the clock, and our compound was designed to affect mutations. Yeah? So you wouldn't expect the compound to do anything to the clock. You know, so clock, uh, compound, mutations, clock, but there's no link between the mutations and the clock. So the compound shouldn't do anything. And um, it did do something. So it, it basically slowed aging by 50%, which was not a small amount. That was a considerable like retardation of aging. And I think that's, you know, it was above what you could do with rapamycin. Mm -hmm. um, but rapamycin was a different model. So but you know, fifty percent was uh, was was quite quite interesting. So uh, it was it was a little bit hard to explain this result. We later showed that um, with our drug in wild type animals, we didn't actually affect the clock. So there was something going on this mutator mouse that was slowing down epigenetic aging that wasn't going out going on in sort of normal you know normal you know, normal mice, but the, the standard back, uh, B6J um, background strain. Um, so there was some sort of strain specific phenomenon going on. So for us, you know, that, that was that was another fork point, which is, okay, we got this drug, uh, and it, you know, affects mutations, but the mutations aren't really the be all and end all of physiological aging, and you know, they only, you know, this drug only works against the clock in a certain model. So you know, it's either pursue the mitochondrial DNA mutations line of work, which which basically arrives at back at rare diseases. You know, it doesn't doesn't really arrive at aging. You just you just end up focused on that mechanism mechanism or that. You know, that type of therapeutics and you try and find an application for them so you know do we become just a, a damage focused company and then find applications for that or do we you know pursue the, you know, the mission which is from the start which is therapeutic intervention and aging uh, and so yeah for us this result with the clock was um the start of a pivot you know so let's you know let's you know let's sort of go uh, back to square one and how do we go back to square one uh, that became the question, and uh, it didn't take us long to sort of, sort of sit down, really think about this properly. So, clocks, you know, clocks are fantastic. They allow us to play around in the cell or the body and get a readout. You know, if I play around with this part of the cell or the body, do I affect aging? Um, there's a rapid, you know, question and answer response, like a great iterative cycle. And you can make some real progress as far as like, you know, uh, knowledge and interventions are concerned. Mm -hmm. um, but, but, you know, People have been doing this in a piecemeal way. So I just, you, you know, I applied the clock to my hypothesis, which is mitochondrial DNA mutations drive aging. You know, that, that was just a hypothesis. How wrong, how wrong that hypothesis was is, you know, that's, that's the question. It's like, how far off are you from your, um, your assumption? So, you know, other people tested different hypotheses, but the ultimate way to, you know, it's almost the ultimate uh, hypothesis test is, is like a CRISPR screen where you, 
you basically go through every single gene in the genome and mm -hmm. you just de delete it. Yeah, you remove that function from the cell um, and then you see, you know, what happens. And so, you know, for us, it was about, you know, delete this gene from the cell. What happens to aging? Delete gene number two from the cell. What happens to aging? Just go through all the, you know, 20,000 genes and do that. Uh, and that's, you know, that, that's the type of approach where you're going to, the, the biology is going to do the talking. It's going to tell you where to look. And then once you're in the once you're in the right part of the you know the story or the biology, that's you know it, you've just got far more confidence moving forwards. You know both both from a scientific perspective, but also when you get to preclinical clinical, you know, these hugely expensive programs that end up end up costing billions. Sure. You really want to you really want to be building on the best biology. Uh, and you know I think also at the same time there were people like Tan Bio um, who do uh, sort of cellular reprogramming for rejuvenation. Mm -hmm. I remember them presenting at a conference and they, they showed that they'd reversed aging. And, you know, I, I thought I'd, you know, got a real breakthrough by slowing aging by 50%. And then, like, we've reversed aging. And, like, one, one part of me was like, oh, this is, this is amazing, like, the scientist part. But the other part of me, which is, you know, invested all that time and effort in a hypothesis, like, it's getting, like, stabbed in the heart. It's like, oh, my God, you know, this, this has just superseded what I'm doing. And I, I just didn't want to be in that position again, you know, where I'm doing something. And because we don't, we haven't done this, the, the sweep of the biology, right. something comes out from the left or something comes out from the right and it just, you know, completely pulls the rug out of what you're doing. So the only way to do that is to go back to first principles, do a sweep of the biology, let it do the talking. Uh, and at the same time, uh, Tony Whiskeray at Stanford uh, had done this fantastic study called the uh, uh, Tabuli Muris Senis. Yep. Or at least I think that's the name of the database. So he'd characterized mouse aging at the single cell level, um, basically using sort of transcriptome technology. So just basically gene expression data from every single cell in the mouse across uh, an aging time course. Uh, and he made it publicly available, uh, which I think was, you know, it's, it's, it's hugely generous. Um, but this provided a, like a playground for aging scientists. You know, you could go into that data set, you know, try and explore different hypotheses, you know, like you're looking at one tissue, does that link to another tissue? What's the commonalities across the tissue? What are the differences? So many questions in there. Uh, but for us, there was, there was actually uh, a more interesting question, which was we, we could, we, we identified a route to doing a CRISPR screen for aging. Um, and, and basically this was, this was the route. So there was no such thing as a, uh, a, a you know, basically a clock, um, that you could combine with a CRISPR screen. So you could take the epigenetic aging clock and just do basically bulk CRISPR. So you take a cell population, knock out a gene, apply the clock. But if you do that for 20,000 genes, it, it wouldn't be quite a human genome project, but it would be something very expensive, mm -hmm. very lab laborious, yeah. Um, but then the uh, 10X Genomics came along with this machine called the uh, Chromium. And what this allowed you to do was a single cell CRISPR with a simultaneous transcriptome. So basically you could knock out a mm -hmm. gene in a single cell and get a transcriptome from that single cell. And you could do a, a, a full CRISPR screen in a cell population uh, for you know, a, a, a far less, you know, far less cost you know, for a reasonable amount, um, something you know, within reach basically. Uh, but the problem is the only way to be able to do a CRISPR screen for aging using that machine was to have a single cell transcriptomic clock because that was what you had to work with. Yeah? You had the Single, uh, single cell knockout and then the single cell transcriptome. Mm -hmm. So we had to try and find a way to create a single cell uh, aging clock. And, and Whiskeray's Tabulimura Senis had single cell data, allowed us to basically play around with lots of different methods, try and crack this problem. Uh, and yeah, long story short, we were able to crack this problem, create a meaningfully accurate clock. So that, by meaningful, I mean it's a sufficient accuracy that you know, when you do the screen, you get an aging readout. You're not worried about false, you know, not so worried about false positives and negatives. Like the the, the, the it's far likely that you, you know the signal used to be a true signal. So we we created this single cell aging clock, and we were we were like, oh wow, we've done it. Yeah, now let's get on with the CRISPR screen. But just before just before we wanted to uh, go ahead with this CRISPR screen, which was quite expensive, you know, not as expensive as you know our original proposition without the 10x genomics chromium, but still something to think about, yeah, before you, um, you know, hand the money over. We realized that the, the approach had a couple, well, it had, had a big flaw, and we were also missing a trick. So the big flaw um, doing a CRISPR screen with uh, the 10x genomics machine is that you have single gene knockouts. So you're, you're actually asking a very narrow question, which is, 
you know, if I if I disrupt a single gene, what's the relationship to aging? You know, and if I disrupt this gene on its own, what's the relationship to aging? Uh, you, you remove the you remove the question, which is if I disrupt, I don't know, three, you know, above one gene, you know, what mm -hmm. happens to aging? Right. So there's this there's this combinatorial space that you can't access uh, with this system, uh, and and that's that's a real problem because you know, like you know, we we want to do this CRISPR screen for aging, but we wanted to find the you know. Wanted to find the answers, not just single gene answers, and and also in the opposite direction. And I'll tell you about this later. Like you can apply these methodologies to say rejuvenation. Um, we didn't, you know, we didn't want to just find gene the single. You know, what's the, you know, we didn't want the question to be, um, you know, how do we rejuvenate best with a single gene? We just want to know, like the question is, how do we want to rejuvenate the best? Full stop. Yeah, sure. Yeah, independent of one gene, two gene. Uh, so. Yeah, we didn't go ahead with this CRISPR screen, and we we actually uh, we we read about you know what Yamanaka did when he was in quite a similar you know he was in a sort of a similar position in a different context. So yep. Yamanaka um, Yamanaka wanted to access combinatorial space, and what he did instead of knocking out genes singly, he he synthesized a bunch of genes, threw them into cells. You know you could you could do this in sort of a negative sense as well, knock them out. Um, so he, he basically he took a, a slightly less fashionable approach, less modern approach, but he could access combinatorial space. So that, that was, you know, that was the problem. And then the, the, the trick we were missing or the opportunity was when we looked at our single cell aging clock, we realized that it was a little bit more than just a readout for aging. So this clock was built out of genes and we noticed that many of the genes in the clock had already been linked to aging and they were, you know, they were known to yeah, be, be affect lifespan or drive aging phenotypes. One of the genes in the clock was actually sufficient on its own to accelerate aging. And as far as as far as we're aware, there's no other clock that enriches so much aging biology. So you know, when when I use the term driver clock, um, I'm trying to discriminate from clocks that don't seem to be connected to uh, you know the previous literature as far as aging biology is concerned. And our clock, which seems to you know these these usual suspects show up. Mm -hmm. It gives us a lot. It gives us a lot of confidence. We're like over the target. Yeah, it doesn't necessarily mean we're over the target. Other clocks could be finding new biology, and they enrich, like they enrich the new biology over the, the existing biology. But it's certainly very encouraging to see these like positive controls. These things showing up. Uh, so that was the first thing. The second thing is that it's very easy to test whether the genes we're looking at are in fact driving aging because they're genes, and, and there's very there's many mature technologies to disrupt genes or you know um basically change gene expression so crispr is one of them you can mm -hmm. knock out a gene see what happens uh there's si rnas which you can basically knock down genes or do this um do the opposite uh, you can overexpress genes you know so that's a very clean intervention uh so you know our ability to test the causality is much higher as well with these these gene-based clocks and then finally because these are genes, um, they're very easy to target therapeutically. So, you know, you can create an mRNA targeting a gene, or you can create a small molecule targeting a gene product, uh, sort of in contrast to, say, methylation-based clocks, where, you know, there's lots of methyl sites that make up these clocks, but it's incredibly hard to target one sure. methyl site in the genome precisely, you know, without touching anything else. So we've got all these tailwinds when we work with, uh, you know, genes and trying to make clocks. And we, we realized this after the fact, like we weren't, you know, we weren't sort of, uh, you know, we won't pretend we were like super intelligent and figured this all out ahead of time. It was really like sort of, you know, looking at what, you know, there's a signal coming out of these things. So, you know, the fact these genes were staring us at us in the face and showing us they were, at, we were you know, they were drivers, it, you know, that was, that was really a decision point for us. And, you know, aging is one thing. So one approach is to look at what's going on in aging with these, uh, you know, these gene driver clocks and basically just flip, flip those genes the opposite mm -hmm. direction. So, you know, if they go this direction with aging, flip it back. You know, um, you know if this one goes down with aging, flick it, flick it up. You know, it's just like, you know, take the clock and just flick, flick all the um, positions back to where they were when they were young. That's one approach. But it's, you know, it's, you make an assumption, which is that aging is self-contained and you know when it goes one direction, you can just spin it back the other way, and um, that's that's not a foregone conclusion. You know there might be pathways outside of aging that need to be activated to push to push this thing in reverse. Mm -hmm. uh, so so what we what we sort of um, you know what we came across next was you know there are existing ways to rejuvenate the cell. Yeah, so 
Um, the most powerful way, powerful way to rejuvenate cells um, is actually Yamanaka factors. So these are the pluripotency factors that can basically be used to take a, say a skin cell or an adult cell and make it into a stem cell. Mm -hmm. um, they, they, also, they also rejuvenate at a rapid rate. So, you know, you can take a cell aged 60 years and in 17 days rejuvenate it to zero years. So, you know, 60 years of aging, it takes 60 years to build up whatever that aging is and then 17 days to get rid of it. There's nothing else like it that's been discovered as far as rejuvenation is concerned. So, you know, these, uh, you, you have this existing rejuvenation paradigm and what we did was we applied the same driver clock methodology, but to a different time course, which was rejuvenation time course. So, you know, you can basically use the same, the same system to extract the driving biology from the, you know, the rejuvenation time course. Mm -hmm. And when we do this, we get this list of genes and these genes are, you know, extremely exciting. They're very interesting. Many of, many of the genes show up on the aging side, you know, so they're not, they're not linked to pluripotency, uh, which is linked to cancer. Um, you know, they're, they're things that happen in aging. And then we, we see other things that aren't pluripotent that, you know, have a really interesting role, a possible role in aging. So we've got this list now, uh, which is it's, it's basically we've applied our methodology to uh, a rejuvenation time course, which is the Yamanaka factors. And uh, we, we have this list, which we think is safe biology or represents mm -hmm. safe biology. And we're ready, like we're ready to basically throw these genes into a cell like Yamanaka did with his, uh, you know, with his pluripotency candidates. We've got our rejuvenation candidates. We want to throw them in and basically arrive at the, you could call them rejuvenation factors instead of Yamanaka factors. Yeah. Uh, so that's what we're absolutely focused on now. You know, we've done this bioinformatic work. We could keep trying to iterate the bioinformatic work, but until we've got a connection with the real world, which is going into the dish and sort of, you know, making sure that our predictions actually, uh, you know, translate into real results. Like we're, we're, we're absolutely focused on just going to the dish and seeing, you know, are these predictions correct? You know, how, how correct, how wrong, you know, and if they are slightly wrong, how can we try and improve them and do all of these experiments? So it's, it's actually a very singular task right now. Let's get into the dish. Let's get some real world feedback. Let's see what nature says about what we think is going on. So yeah, it's a very exciting time for us, and uh, yeah, and we're recruiting, we're investing. Well, not investing. We would like some investment to basically change gears. You know, give this experiment the resources it really needs to get a clear yes or no. And when we do get a no, we want to be able to iterate. You know, so getting a no quickly is going to give us way more information than just trying to perpetually just trying to improve our bioinformatics and only try once. We want to get into the dish. We want to see what happens. If it doesn't work. We want to go back, back to the bioinformatics. It's going to be this cycle that spins basically for the next two years. And it's analogous to Craig Venter with the uh, the sort of the, the attempt to make synthetic life. So he had a bunch of genes that he thought was you know sufficient for synthetic life. Threw them into a uh, you know sort of a it's it's everything minus the genome basically. Throws the genome in. Didn't didn't work. Went back to the methods. Iterated the methods. Tried again really some clever strategies. I think he got it He got it to work on the third or fourth time. So we see something similar happening, basically trying to whistle down to sort of the core, uh, you know, factors for safe rejuvenation. So I've probably been talking quite a long time now, but that's, that's sort of a good break point, you know, where, where we started, where we are. Yeah, it's a, it, it's a fascinating a journey you just took us on. Um, I think you're definitely on a on, on the right path. Um, you know, to unpack a little of it, you, you've walked us through um, clocks, uh, biologic clocks. You've taken us to the epigenetic clocks. You've introduced us to the concept of driver. Uh, we talked a little bit on previous shows about you know in, in the cancer domain difference between drivers and passengers. Uh, it's very elegant. And then you you uh, you took us down to um, cellular reprogramming, Yamanaka factors, and sort of this decoupling uh, of rejuvenation from pluripotency, because you know, we, we want a little of both at certain times. You know, obviously aging, you want more rejuvenation, regeneration, you may want a little closer to pluripotency, but um, obviously you, you're heavily focused on, on aging. Um, the one thing I have to ask, and I, you know, I watched your, your presentation recently where you sort of put some of the data up there uh, or some of the maps of, of these transcriptomes and so forth, you know, uh, and I, I have all, all the respect in the world for, for uh, Shini Yamanaka, but a lot of people forget or don't, may not know that, you know, in 2012, there was somebody else that got the, um, 
the Nobel Prize also, Dr. John Gurdon. And, you know, they both came at the same problem, but from sort of very different, you know, Yamanaka, as you, you were pointing out, you know, he did a lot of exploration of that combinatorial space. Uh, a lot of Gurdon's work, you know, it's like, hey, we got 3,000 proteins and all these genes and blah, blah, blah. Uh, also very important to reprogramming. Um, I'm just interested because, uh, you know, when you look at Gurdon's work, which goes back decades and you know, okay, there's obviously uh, epigenetic modifying substances and things that remodel organelles and everything else that goes on in, in taking a somatic cell and turning it into uh, something embryonic. Are you running into any of the and if this is confidential, and just tell me to shut up and I'll go in a different direction, but are you running into any uh, factors as you're beginning to look at this data come in um, that say, hey, you know, Dr. Gurdon, you, know, you were on, you, you had some stuff there, the Yamanak eliminated it, but hey, these may be very useful drivers, as you call them, in this whole process of rejuvenation. So, so I'm, I'm ashamed to say, I don't know enough about reprogramming um, to, to basically comment on that. So yeah, J John Gurdon, the Gurdon Institute is actually in Cambridge and he's, right. he, yeah, he's one of the, you know, he's still there as the, as the head of the Institute. Yep. Um, but yeah, he did, he did sort of fantastic work just showing that the cytoplasm which is a one egg right. uh, could, could basically reprogram the nucleus. You know, it's, it's sort of the, the early days. Um, but yeah, I mean, we've just entered the cellular reprogramming world and it's almost like winner takes all as, as far as attention is concerned as well. So for us, it was simply public data sets you know, that we could use. So Yamanaka just put them up there, mm -hmm. we use them. Uh, you know, there's actually, it's a very rich resource from Yamanaka's lab. So he has rejuvenation you know, time courses from like five different tissues. So you can actually make a multi-tissue rejuvenation clock you know, that works across five tissues and pick out biology that it's for five tissues from a translation perspective that's much more interesting so i think we were we were just uh you know we were drawn to the publicly available data and yeah beggars can't be choosers right and uh, uh, yeah and um, there, there might be data for john gurdon but i you know i'm i'm not deep enough into the reprogramming field uh, perhaps this is something that will change um our cso brendan that isn't with us today uh he's sort of at the front lines now increasingly on taking a back seat probably for the best uh, because he's, you know, Brendan can just go so deep into these clocks and explore everything. Uh, I'm more sort of on the utility side, yeah, like how do we keep pulling in this direction until the very end, you know, where we can actually you know, open up a packet and do some pretty crazy things. Uh, but yeah, I'm, it's certainly, I'm certainly going to take a note to look at what John Gurdon did put out there and see if there's anything that corroborates or conflicts. I mean, some, Something that you might, you might, we did come across that you, you haven't mentioned is that uh, Vadim Gladshev at Harvard, this is a, this is a fascinating finding. So, you know, reprogramming fats is, you could say, oh, this is very artificial. Yeah, you know, you're doing this thing to the cell. It's not natural. You're going to cause lots of problems. But Vadim Gladshev has shown that at the, the moment of conception isn't your youngest age. Yeah, so you'd think right. that, you know, the sperm meets the egg. That's as young as you're ever going to be. Right. And then you get older. Actually, in the first few days, at least in mice, you get younger first and then you pull out of your youth, you know, your sort of uh, your rejuvenation phase and then you start aging. So there's this natural rejuvenation event. And that's actually a fantastic safety result because that that means that the cell has, you know, it, it uses it uses this system. It can't be so dangerous because otherwise, you know, the cell wouldn't be able to use it and you know, basically rejuvenate. So this is like, this is, you have the tools to do this and your cells use these tools uh, at the, the very beginning of your yep. life. Yep. So the, the possibility exists, you know, basically you could do this again and, you know, they've been used safely at the beginning and then they could be, they could be used safely again. There is an argument. Um, I think there's somebody that made a comment when I, you know, sort of tried to uh, point out this exciting finding. They said that um, embryonic stem cells or those early, you know, those early collection of cells, they do suppress uh, a lot of uh, sort of oncogenes and things like that. So you can put tumor cells into sort of early embryos and you don't get tumors. There's some sort of activity that basically just keeps the tumor at bay. So perhaps there's a window where you can do things that are, you know, tumorigenic as far as, you know, uh, cellular mechanisms are concerned. But on the other side, that you know, there's also the possibility that these are perfectly safe mechanisms. We only use them early on and we could just reactivate them later. And certainly when we look at our gene lists, you know, these don't seem to be genes that cause, uh, you know, a, a huge cause for concern. Ultimately, we've got to test that in the dish. 
because uh, there's plenty of genes that are not pluripotent on their own right. and in, combina in combination they create pluripotent stem cells yeah. so it's you know we can't you know we've got to really do the experiment basically yeah it's, it's interesting because i was just uh, i was just on the show uh a you should watch the episode with um, John Chernoff at Fox Chase Cancer Center, which is down the road here, because that's where in the 1970s, Beatrice Mintz first demonstrated the phenomena that you're talking about, how the, uh, in, in the case of the embryo, it had this amazing uh, suppression ability. Until this day, um, B. Mintz is still alive. She's 100 now. But until this day, no one has really explained why this is the case, and whether it's that the, the tumor suppressor genes are silenced in some way, or whether it's just this, uh, you know, the terminology they used to use back then, these morphogenetic fields, uh, and they occur in plants, in, embry in embryos, uh, in, the, in the regenerative kingdom. Um, they have a great ability to, uh, despite all these oncogenes being around, uh, create normal phenotypes. And uh, so I think that may be something very exciting for you there as well, as you further explore this combinatorial space, uh, to really understand what are some of these uh, dynamics that are going on as you separate pluripotency and rejuvenation um, to, to keep to nor sort of normalized tissues. And, 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 and so I, I think you have a, <laughs> a lot of great stuff you can dive into here and it's very exciting. Um, just talk a little bit, I mean, you mentioned a little bit about the angel financing early on. Uh, are you doing a current round? I, I know you were, I saw something about you hiring some people recently. What's uh, just to the, the business level? Uh, What's, what's happening next? Yeah, so we've been going uh, four years, firstly on a mitochondrial trajectory, but then yep. uh, basically, you know, adopting technologies, pivoting, uh, really just, you know, being part of the dynamic. And, you know, things have changed quite dramatically over the time since we founded Chef2 now um, for the better. Uh, just, you know, things are like, yeah, you know, just, just the, the pace of change is incredible. Like right? the, the amount of progress, just trying to keep up with it. Yep. Um, and yeah, it's just going to be a fantastic spectacle to watch. So right now, uh, we, we're at this stage where we, we're ready, yeah? we're poised to go into the lab, but these are going to be quite expensive experiments. So we're going to have to synthesize a bunch of genes. We're going to have to have lab scientists uh, sort of in parallel so that if one of us goes ill, we've got continuity, like the experiments aren't held up. Uh, like we need to basically sort of go broad. Uh, so we're, we're starting to hire. Um, we, we're about to open a fundraising round. So it's a, it's a lot more than we've raised in the, in the past um, so that those details will be sort of published relatively soon mm -hmm. uh, but yeah if, if, yeah we're, we're we're particularly drawn to anybody out there that's you know like articulated their interest in clocks their interest in reprogramming trying to go below the surface of reprogramming because there's so much to know yeah you know like once you you know there's this there's this phenomenon and now we've got this thing called machine learning that can be used to sort of separate you know the drivers from the yep from the passengers and i think that avenue hasn't really been entertained to the extent that we you know we think it could be so the, for us that's a huge opportunity like maybe you could do enough with the yamanaka factors but they are pluripotency, pluripotency factors don't forget you know that's what they right. were opt optimized to do so uh you know i i hope there's some application for them but i, I you know i think the ultimate goal is uh clinical breadth yeah so highly safe drugs where we can go anywhere clinically yep. Um, and because we're focusing on rejuvenation, this is actually a very different type of drug. This is a drug that you would give to somebody that's healthy. Yeah. So it's like a statin for aging yeah? yep. or statin for all the age linked diseases. It's, it's that class of drug. And safety is the primary concern for that type of drug uh, because, you know, you don't have a, a, you know, you don't have a disease that's unraveling and you're, you're sort of close to some really scary things. It's the opposite. You're in a good place. You want to stay in a good place. The need, the need to do no harm is, is sort of paramount. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's, 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 if you're working on rejuvenation, that's what you're really working on. You're working on a prophylactic drug that puts off diseases. Uh, you know, if, if that's your core focus, that's the type of drug that, you know, is, is going to arrive at. And um, there's age linked diseases, which are actually a much higher bar than rejuvenation because you've got rejuvenation, which is a big problem, a new problem to solve, not a small problem, a big problem. And then you've got a specific unraveling on top of that aging. So, you know, you push, you, you push your body to the edge with aging and it unravels in one trajectory and you push somebody else to the edge and they unravel in a different trajectory, which is Alzheimer's or, you know, uh, Parkinson's, that direction. So 
that's very two different types of phenomena. And you've got this very complex process, which is aging and, you know, it's sort of, it's a slow burn, right? Or slow boil, whichever analogy you want to use. But then you've got this rapid unraveling usually for these diseases. Yeah? And that's a, it's like a completely different dynamic and process. And that requires one solution. You know, disease requ requires one solution. This aging proce process requires another. And if you want to target an aging disease, you have to execute on both fronts simultaneously. And it's, it's hard enough to, you know, target the aging disease biology and the aging biology, you know, so um, really, if you're going to focus, especially if you're a new company, you've got to focus on something and do it well. So, you know, we're, we're focusing on the rejuvenation biology. We anticipate that if we get that right, we might be able to combine it with some disease specific interventions or, you know, biology, there's some biology and someone's created interventions. You know, farmers done that well, traditionally, right? They, they haven't focused on aging, they've just disease biology so maybe there'll be a coming together between this sort of new area and pharma and then it, then it should be a synergy right you know it's, it's more than the sum of the parts right. but you know one one step at a time so we're going to you know work on this problem um and and do as much as we can with the, with the data available uh, we're going to generate our own data right now actually even even ahead of the financing basically set us up uh, for the best possible shot on goal so we're going to reprogram the very system that we're then going to try and put our own genes into so basically reprogram the system, train a clock that predicts genes, and then throw genes into that very system. So the distance between our prediction and the system that we're testing our prediction is, you know, basically minimum. Uh, so, you know, uh, give ourselves the best possible chance. So this doesn't take very much time. It doesn't take particularly uh, a, lot of, a lot of financing either. So that's what we're doing right now. Um, and then when we go into the dish, we've got a stupid name for this. Uh, we call it Clockmas Day. Not Christmas Day, Clockmas Day. <laughs> After the clocks, uh, we've got a countdown timer um, that I've, I've got especially to remind me, you know, just we've got to, like Christmas Day, you can't move Christmas Day. So, you know, it's, it's going to happen whether you like it or not. You just need to make sure you're ready. And similarly, we want to be ready by, you know, uh, when, when Clockmas Day arrives, we don't want to, we want to make sure that we're not wasting any time. It'd be such right. a shame if, you know, we were to, you know, I think Aubrey de Grey makes these great arguments. You know, if we could bring the point of safe rejuvenation drugs forward by two weeks, you know, there's there's people that just you know they're gonna they're gonna benefit like right? it's not just an extra few years because it's like these, these these sort of stepping stones right you get the first one means you can make it to the next stepping stone it, it could be like it could be quite dramatic even just a few weeks um ahead of ahead of schedule so yeah yeah we're working hard it's a it's, it's an exciting program and i i really uh uh, wish you the best with this. It's uh, I, I definitely think you're on the right path, and you're doing some very unique things um, as, as I see in the space. So I, I uh, I'm excited for you, and uh, hopefully can help you get the word out. Um, one last thing, I, I I was reading totally separate from all this that you are uh, a big fan of something called first person view drone racing. Do you get to do that much <laughs> anymore? Or are you totally focused on the uh, the lab? You get to unwind sometimes. Yeah, so a, a scientist life, it's a very lonely pursuit. Uh, so, yeah, when I was a PhD student, I just, you know, I, I just sat in a lab, usually on my own, into the late hours around just inanimate objects, not many human beings around, uh, just trying to get these things done, right? It's all, in, it's all encompassing. You sort of get into this zen, you know, like you're just doing things quite yeah. therapeutic. Um, but you know, your, your mind can just spin and there's nobody around sort of, you know, you know sort of bring you back down. I remember ha like struggling to sleep um, during my PhD. Like, I had to switch all the lights off, just sit there, just try and sort of calm down a bit. Mm. Uh, so <laughs> like, once a year, I went on this ski holiday with my friend Nick, who's like completely different personality. And I just got it out of my system. And that was like a reset for, the, for another year of this. Um, so, yeah, so more recently... <laughs> Basically, in the period between you know, setting up my company, trying to see if this was a company or you know it was going to be a, a not-for-profit, uh, there were there were times where I was just I just needed to bring in some money, and I you know my um, my brother uh, set up a website that sold these sold these drones, and uh, basically I was a researcher, so I could research uh, you know what was good, what wasn't good, really get to the bottom of it, and I sort of helped him out with this. Um, I decided to buy one of these things. Just because you know to, to learn the customer, it's, mm -hmm. it's sometimes good you know to, to get that side. Sure. Uh, and it's just it's absolutely fantastic. It's it, it's sort of you put on this headset, and you basically see what this machine sees, and you just feel like a bird. Like honestly, it's that feeling. You just forget that you're on the ground. 
uh, when, when you know my 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 girlfriend well girlfriend at the time now wife you know used to film me and sort of you just forget where your head you know where your head is like your head's pointed up like this and you're like you always fall over yeah because you're just you're in a different place and uh yeah i i, I used to fly these things a bit, bit uh more often only about one hour a week now but it's it's amazing it's just an amazing experience sort of takes you away from everything like you just sometimes you need to just slow down a bit yep. a little bit of a reset and then you, you sharpen the blade and you go back and you're, you're all the better for it but yeah it's, that's that's a lot of fun um it's a bit of an adrenaline thing uh but you know i think it's, it's a relatively safe way of getting your adrenaline flex no i i think it's uh it's, i've never done it it's, it sounds extremely fun but i think it's important to, you know obviously you have to uh you're on the cusp of greatness but at the same time this stuff can <laughs> uh can drive you slightly insane so it's always good to, uh, to yeah, disconnect so, so, and right, have fun so, this, this reminds me so you know when you you know when we're pursuing this this goal yeah this is a very long-term project and yeah we, we don't really know where the finishing line is until we you know is that are there safe rejuvenation genes are we going to target them with therapeutic mRNAs or small molecules can we get to all the biology we want to in the, like, there's so many important questions where we need to get sort of you know get the answers then ask the questions again uh but you know, ultimately, what are we doing this for? It's to get more healthy life. Yeah, that's yep. that's the ultimate goal, right? Yep. Um, and you know, some people, you know, we have these we have these sort of debates sometimes. Like some people, are, I don't I don't want to live any longer. Um, and some people, are like, yeah, give me more life. And so that there is there seems to be a divide, right? There's those people that love life and they want more of it, yep. and there's those people that you know they could take it or leave it, and that's fine, yeah. But you you do want to give people the option. So something I wanted to do at Shift was, you know. Like we're doing this because I, you know, for instance, I would, I'd love an extra twenty years. Yeah, you, know? you, know, you could, uh, you could travel the world. There's all these these things you could do. You know, like the the frontier of space is opening up. You know, that's a fantastic thing if you had more time just mm -hmm. to see the future. Like I'd just be, you know, like back to the future. Just that's fantastic because you know, like to go into the future and see what's happening and like what's different. There's there's, there's all these frontiers we just don't have access to at the moment. And this allows us to get to those sorts of things. But, you know, I wanted to have a board, which is like, what would you do with 20 years extra life? Yeah. You know, um, and for me, I'd, I'd probably fly drones a bit more. You know, Excellent. that's that's one of the things that I'd write. It just seems like a really, you know, childish thing. But actually, it's, it's a fantastic thing. You know, I used to play a lot of music. I'd do a bit more music. Uh, it's, it's a really great thought exercise. If you had, you know, if time wasn't a finite resource, like how would you structure your life? You know, what would you do things? I think. Mean, I think we had this discussion there was like a an x prize event it's like you know what does loyalty mean when you've got an infinite horizon like is it okay to be married to somebody for 150 years then you know then leave them or you know you, is that is that not fair like the idea of marriage is that fair to put that framework onto a infinite time um but yeah like just you know i'd like to do a bit more fpv droning if i <laughs> if these drugs do work but yeah at the moment it just helps it helps to keep me sort of you know in the right place at work so, you know, I do recommend a hobby to somebody like you can, if, if you, if you're just a hundred percent on one problem, um, I think, I think it's much easier to burn out to sort of have a little bit of balance because, you know, you're a human being, uh, you're not designed to sure. like just, just pummel one problem like day in and day out for 20 years. It's like, that's going to change your personality a little bit. That's true. That's true. And uh, yeah. yeah, that balance is so critical, but um, yeah. I mean, you're on the right path. And uh, yeah, after you solve this longevity thing, then uh, <laughs> there's there's a lot more that you'll be, you'll be able to do after that. But uh, I think as a field, as a field, I'm very optimistic. You, you just, you know, there's, it, I, I talk about the race for rejuvenation. You know, like mm -hmm. there's just my favorites. There's like eight shots on goal. And these are, you know, these are things, you know, these are interventions that have reversed aging or done something to an aging disease. Like it's happening. It's yep. not, it's, I don't think it's a winner, what, you know, the winner takes all here. I think, you know, if everybody just makes progress, tries to share to the extent possible um, with each other, like we're going to all move to a better place. And of course, there's going to be a competitive dynamic that takes over. But I mm -hmm. want that to be in the, you know, I want the competitive space to be between, you know, different, different magnitudes of safe rejuvenation, right? Not rejuvenation versus zero or, you know, dangerous or those sorts of things. Like let's all move to a really right. great place. And then compete, yeah. And then, then it's sort of a fun competition, not this uh, sort of zero sum game. So yeah, yeah, I don't think the zero sum game is appropriate right now. No, no, I'm completely in agreement with that one. With you. Really, really great stuff, Daniel. And I, um, I, I, you know, 
thanks for taking the time out of your schedule to do this. I really appreciate the the deep dive you you gave to us and uh, and this vision um, for everybody that's going to be listening to this episode on uh, the podcast network or watching on the YouTube channel. Uh, you've been listening to Dr. Daniel Ives, founder and chief executive officer uh, of Shift Biosciences. Uh, we will put links in the uh, the bio for the show so you can check everything out. Uh, Daniel, I want to thank you uh, for taking the time again to come on the show. Thanks for everything you're doing there at Shift. And uh, as we say on our show, thank you for helping to create a better tomorrow through everything you're doing. It's uh, very, very inspiring. You're very welcome, Ira. Pleasure to come on.